Kelly, you're muted. Hi there, I'd like to welcome everybody. We are now live. Thank you for joining us. We're going to wait a minute or two for some more people to join us because there's quite a lot of people logging on still. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, we will get going in about two minutes. I'll take the opportunity to mention to you all that as we're talking, you'll be able to see the live Q&A button. Um, it is, if you're on a phone, it's in your upper right hand corner. It looks like a speech bubble with a question mark on it and you can click on that. If you're on a laptop or a PC, it should be, I think in your upper right corner too. Uh, but if it isn't, it is down in the center of your screen. If you hover your cursor in the lower center, you'll see it there too. Again, it is a speech bubble with a question mark on it. If you click on that, you'll be able to see the live Q&A feed. What we're going to do is publish in that feed some questions as they're put in. Um, so do type questions, but have a look at the published ones to see if your question is already there. If it is, like it, because we're going to prioritize the asking of the questions with the most likes, if you get me. So just mentioning that, I'll be mentioning it again a little further into the webinar. And again, I'm saying we're seeing a lot of people logging on still, um, which is great. And I know sometimes people can have minor issues getting onto Teams, so thank you for your patience if you've had issues getting on. Um, so one more minute or so and we will kick off. OK. I'm going to get going now and I'm going to introduce um, this webinar. This uh, webinar is going to be about the COVID-19 resources and in particular the SBA uh, IDLE and PPP loans. We're happy to touch on other things as we go. We also are lucky enough to have a representative uh, a senior legal counsel for the TWC has joined us. If there are questions in relation to unemployment, whether it's a, an employer or a self-employed person, we have an expert here to answer those questions too. So I am going to welcome you all and I am now going to introduce our executive director, Adriana Cruz, who is going to open the event formally. Welcome, Adriana. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes, I, can hear you. I yes. see Jarvis. I see Jarvis nodding yes and Kelly says yes. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Adriana Cruz. I'm the executive director for economic development and tourism office in the office of Governor Greg Abbott. Um, I'm very happy to, to be kicking off today's uh, webinar uh, for you. Uh, Governor Abbott appointed me to this position in October of 2019, and it's uh, my honor to lead the state's economic development efforts. Uh, these are unprecedented times, and our team at the office has been working uh, tirelessly to make sure that small business owners in Texas have access to the latest information and resources uh, available in these challenging times. Uh, this is also a very fluid situation. Uh, programs are, are being made available uh, right now. Um, the uh, Small Business Administration and the, the federal government are working on a, um, a new package uh, to be made available of $320 billion. So I'm sure we're going to hear about that today. Um, Governor Abbott's focus um, has been on the health and safety of Texans. Uh, you all may have seen on Friday, uh, he uh, announced his uh, strike force to open Texas. Uh, I'm honored to be a member of that strike force on the Special Advisory Council and also the co-chair of the Economic Revitalization Team. Uh, so we are going to be looking at how to strategically and methodically and safely uh, open different um, industry sectors within the state of Texas uh, so that we can get our economy uh, going again and get um, Texans uh, back to work. Um, in addition, he has issued uh, several waivers 
uh, during this time uh, to help some of our small business owners uh, waivers regarding trucking regulations to allow uh, delivery of needed resources, um, regulations regarding restaurants being able to uh, sell alcoholic beverages um, so that they can uh, continue to, to operate on a, a pickup or delivery um, uh, uh, method. Um, in addition to that, um, the governor uh, requested a disaster declaration uh, back in March uh, so that our Texas businesses could qualify for programs through the Small Business Administration, like the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program uh, and the Paycheck Protection Program, which we will uh, learn about the latest today. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, turn it over and um, uh, turn it over to you, Kelly. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adriana. I am now going to introduce each of our North Texas community partners with whom we have worked to bring this webinar to you. I'm going to introduce each of them and they're going to take a moment to introduce themselves. So we will kick off with July Danley from the Stephenville Chamber of Commerce. Over to you, July. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the Stephenville Chamber of Commerce has been serving as the voice of business in our area since 1911. And as I'm sure is the case with most of our fellow North Texas Chambers, the majority of our membership are made up of small businesses. Not only are these businesses vital to our um, local economy, but they are an integral role in the quality of life we enjoy and are just simply the heart and spirit of our communities. So we're very grateful and appreciative to all of the partners that are on this webinar today that have been communicating and collaborating and very much passionately and diligently helping our members to navigate the assistance options as well as what best suits their sp specific situation. Um, so we look forward to continuing to be a voice for our business and connecting them to important resources that they're going to get to learn more about today. Uh, together, we really will persevere together through these challenging times. Great. Thank you, July. Our next partner is the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce and Chris Strayer is going to say a quick word. Uh, hello everyone, Chris Strayer, Executive Vice President with the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce here. want to echo what July said, really appreciative of the state of Texas, the Economic Development Office, really all of uh, the leaders uh, in our state government for the support and leadership that they're giving during this difficult time. We also, the Fort Worth Chamber, you know, stand at the ready to help the state, the, the small businesses, really businesses of any size in, in the North Texas area. We want to align them with the resources that will help them be successful and weather these times. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, the work that the team has done here to put this webinar together. We've been doing about three webinars a week uh, in the Forward Chamber, providing different resources, information. So I know what a daunting task uh, it can be to, to do that. So really appreciate everybody's collaboration on this and we're happy to be a part of it. So thank you. Great, and thank you, Chris. Our next partner is the City of Texarkana and Lisa Thompson is going to say a word. Lisa, you're muted. Hello everyone, Lisa Thompson here in Texarkana. Just wanted to say thank you to the governor's office for hosting the webinar and thank you to Governor Abbott for his leadership through this crisis. Um, also wanted to welcome our local partners who are tuning in. Uh, man, the small business owners here in our area have been the backbone of our community for a long time and are so resilient and we just are thankful for them and we do want to tell you we're going to get through this together um, and i'm looking forward to the presentation today great thank you lisa and our final partner is the texacana chamber of commerce and michael malone is going to say a few words michael malone was not able to be here today um, okay but the city of texarkana is very grateful to be here Excellent. Well, look, we, we're delighted to work with our four regional partners. Uh, we would have organized physical events with them this year. That's why we have uh, worked with them on this first or second webinar. Um, so I'm going to move along and just introduce our, or just show you who our speakers are today. Um, we have Bridget Moon from the Small Business Administration. We have Bill Leverton, who is part of the Small Business Development Center in Tarleton State University. We have Rodney Johnson, who is part of the Small Business Development Center in Tarrant County. And we also have Elsa Ramos, who is a senior legal counsel. She is the special counsel to Commissioner Demerson at the Texas Workforce Commission. And you'll be hearing from each of these people as we go through our webinar. So I'm going to go straight into the webinar now and start 
you know, bringing on the information that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to call on Bill Leverton to talk about the SPA resources because I think that actually Bridget Moon has not been able to join the webinar. So if, if Bridget isn't there, I'm going to hand it over to Bill. Thank you. Um, I am here, Kelly. Can you oh. not hear me? Fantastic. Sorry. Uh, it's great that you're here. And so I'm going to hand it over to you now to just talk about the SBA's products. OK, awesome. Thank you very much for uh, hosting this and inviting SBA to be part of this presentation today. Uh, there is quite a bit of information, so I'll try to make it as brief as I can. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have four programs. Uh, we have what the payroll protection program and the 10K Advance uh, that are the most popular that are out there. The Payroll Protection Program and the 10K Advance uh, is a lot of times people are, are hearing that uh, this week is uh, the week to get some additional funding. The first round, the appro appropriations did run out. So we're looking forward uh, to help uh, more businesses uh, with their payroll and other needs. So going into the payroll protection program, it is administered uh, by our 7A lenders that you can obtain uh, through uh, district offices resource guide, including ours. Um, it is also in recent of this disaster of COVID-19, we vetted an additional 600 lenders uh, to help with the overflow that our 7A lenders are experiencing with it. So we ask a, a lot of, uh, of your application still pending. Uh, please, we ask for some patience and uh, they will get through them. Uh, this program is to be for payroll costs, as it states, 2.5 months. Uh, there is other eligibility uh, that is certain mortgage interest and utilities and rent that can also be a factor in part of this forgiveness of this payroll protection program. The deadline is to file is June 30th, 2020, as it stands right now. Uh, the deferred loan payment <clears throat> is uh, six to the 12 months. And uh, the, of course, the, the big uh, thing there at States is if the staff it needs to be retained. Uh, and then this, any portion of the loan that is not forgiven, is at a 1% um, rate over two years. Uh, so that is something that uh, is very attractive with the low interest rate um, with the uh, two year term. Now going into the economic injury disaster loan advance program, and I think that's the next slide. <clears throat> if you wanna switch the next slide, Kelly. Uh, yes, I have. Okay, there it is. All right, uh, it is administered by the SBA program. And it's a little different because our, those proceeds are more versatile. Uh, it does go up to 2 million versus the payroll protection goes up to 10 million. Uh, this particular program with the IDLE does have a possible term up to 30 years um, with a deferment of one year. Uh, and it can, it says here just the rent, utilities, and accounts payable, but it can also be used for working capital needs, uh, replacement maybe of inventory that's been expended at this point. Uh, so it is going to require that small business owner to have an extensive uh, conversation with their loan officer and case manager about what their needs are. Uh, the loan part that's, uh, is a separate program than the 10K forgivable advance, uh, which is what states here is a 1,000 allocated per employee up to 10,000. And that's what a lot of people are seeing at this point. Um, however, in the idle advance, just in our recent update numbers for just Texas, there's 63,815 that have been processed, which is over $287 million, just an idle advance this for the state of Texas. So uh, we're pretty excited about that number and it will continue to grow as these additional um, appropriations are allocated. Uh, the other thing is, is that there's the 25K express loans and what that is, it's a, is going to act as a bridge loan and the eligibility stands as if they have an existing relationship with an SBA express lender. 
And that is just to help them with their immediate needs within the hopes of the approval of the idle loan to kind of refinance that express loan. Uh, the collateral, yes, that's very uh, a question that a lot of people have. Well, look, I'm I'm a sole prop. I'm a service based business. I don't have you know any collateral, and that's fine. We take what's the best available for any loan that's over twenty five thousand. So uh, that is something that will also be reviewed at the time that their loan is processed. Some key uh, websites here, just real quick for the idle for since that is administered by SBA is to go to sba.gov uh, forward slash coronavirus. You will see uh, the uh, a heading that has uh, funding options and we'll list the four there that you can click on as it showed in the initial screen right there that you can obtain some additional information including the SBA debt relief program. Uh, since a limited time, uh, we can address that if there's any questions at the back end of this presentation. Uh, we do have a customer service number for the SBA portion of the idle for people that need to get additional questions or maybe to find a current status. And that number is 1-800-659-2955. Otherwise, if they have questions concerning the PPP, that will be administered through their bank that they're uh, processing their application through. We do encourage to uh, get in connection with a district office that is in your area uh, and get signed up for their email newsletter uh, or their Twitter account like ours is S at SBA DFW and our district page is sba.gov forward slash TX forward slash Dallas. And that'll keep you abreast of information as well. Great. Well, thank you, Bridget. That was great. And you'll be hearing from Bridget later on in the webinar. I'm just going to take this moment again to remind you about the live Q&A feed. The button for that you will find in your upper <coughs> right hand corner of your screen. It looks like a speech bubble with a Q on it. You can click on that. You can type in your question. But before you do that, just check out the published questions in case your question has already been asked. And if it has, like that question, because we're going to prioritize the questions that have more likes. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to talk about uh, this very important governor's announcement that was made on the 17th of April. The announcement uh, informed everybody that the governor has formed a strike force to open Texas. It's executive order GA16. I'm going to highlight a particular piece of that, which is the retail to go piece. This means that the governor's announcement is enabling retailers to open again. However, they must only deal with their customers at the curbside or by delivering uh, orders to people's homes. Um, the idea here is that everybody will remain as safe as possible. There are best practice guidelines at this link that we've provided here, and these slides will be available to everybody afterwards. And so I'd urge everybody to look at the guidelines. We really want everybody to remain as safe as possible as we strategically and methodically reopen Texas. Thank you. So now we are at the frequently asked question point of the webinar, and I'm going to ask some frequently asked <laughs> questions that my colleagues and I get regularly, and we felt this would be good because so many people are interested in the answers. So I'm going to field these uh, to our SBDC and our TWC panelists, and I'm going to kick off with my first question, which I'm going to field to Rodney. So Rodney, the first question is, should I apply for both IDLE and PPP programs? How do I make the most of both funding sources? Over to you, Rodney. You might want to unmute yourself. First, I want to tell you uh, thank you for the invitation uh, on behalf of Tarrant County College, on behalf of the Tarrant Small Business Development Center. We're honored to be here to help uh, in, be involved in this uh, information exchange. Uh, to answer your question, should you apply for both the IDL as well as the PPP? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Each of them have their purpose. Each of them have their strengths. And the way that it is structured, you can certainly apply to both. 
there are a couple of things that you should note about them because they do have different purposes. If you are applying for the Paycheck Protection Program, then know that there are certain expenditures related to the payroll that, uh, that can only be used for a Paycheck Protection Program, such as uh, you can use your any payroll costs or healthcare costs, or you can also use uh, the expenses from interest on mortgages or from your rent, or perhaps any of your utilities, if you have electric gas or whatever utilities you may have had, as long as they were in place prior to February the 15th. So then those are eligible costs associated with the Paycheck Protection Program. But if you go over to the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, it has a couple of components in it as well. As was said earlier by Bridget, you can use the IDL for working capital or for other expenditures. There's also a component inside of the IDL that allows for you to have a grant. The grant is paid out currently at $1,000 per employee up to 10 employees, therefore being a maximum opportunity of $10,000. One caveat that everyone who is attempting to apply for both of these should remember or should know is that you can't duplicate or replicate charges on both of those loans. So if you apply, if you, have, if you use uh, payroll costs on the, on the Paycheck Protection Plan, you cannot use those same costs over on the idle side and vice versa. If you're using uh, any of those costs to help calculate your idle loans, you can't use that in the Paycheck Protection Program. So the way to maximize them is to certainly, number one, work with your accountants, work with your CPAs or your, or your financial personnel to make sure that, number one, you identified all of your costs and that you can properly segregate them and apply them to the appropriate loan, be it a Paycheck Protection Program loan or an idle loan. That's great, Rodney. And I'm going to follow it up with another question for you, Rodney. How long after I apply for the PPP or the idle do I have to wait before receiving the funding or the advance? So the initial goals for the for both the idle and the Paycheck Protection Program. They, they, they were goals that uh, for the idle, it was hopeful that if you were to receive the grant, the $10,000 grant or up to $10,000 grant, that they'd be able to process that within a matter of three to four days. The reality is, is that with the overwhelming of the system, that process has taken approximately eight to 10 to 10 days. Uh, for the actual idle loan itself, it was originally in, uh, estimated that the loan application would take approximately two to three weeks. And again, the same the same um, factors are involved in the in the initial evaluation of processing the loan, how long it would take. So we are seeing that it's taking longer uh, for those loans to be processed, for them to be evaluated and to go through their due diligence and then to come back with an answer. Uh, so just understand that this is a system that has that is receiving uh, uh, millions and millions and millions of applications. And therefore it's taking uh, on some cases up to three to four weeks, you know, in order to get a response or get a reply. Uh, in every one of those cases though, the, uh, the process has been pretty much, you go in, you submit your application, say for instance, you're going into IDLE. You can only apply to IDLE going through the SBA website. When you submit your application, one key point that you want to look for is to make sure that you receive a confirmation number. If you receive a confirmation number, that is your receipt or your proof that your loan has been accepted into the system. If you did not receive that number, then your loan has not been uh, accepted into the system or there's been a problem and therefore there's not really a mechanism to let you know that your loan is not being processed. So it will feel like the wait is a lot longer. As far as the PPP side of it, you're working with an individual lender, an approved lender from the SBA. So therefore that individual or that bank or that institution will serve in the role of keeping you up to date in terms of where, where your loan is at in the process, uh, whether it's still in the application phase, 
or whether it is an underwriting or whether it has even been uploaded into the SBA system itself. And so therefore, they'll be able to give you more real time status as to the progress that's being made on your loan. Once it gets into the SBA system, then this SBA system is going to go through its due diligence and it's then it's kind of out of the hands of the lender, but at least you will be able to get information from the lender in terms of the progress of your loans. Okay, super, thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Now, Bill, I'm going to ask Bill Leverton. If I am a sole proprietor or an independent contractor, can I apply for PPP or idle funding even though I have no employees? Yes, the question, the answer to that question, Kelly, is yes, you can. There is a little bit of caveat if you would like to use that word involved with it. Uh, however, you are allowed to apply for both even without employees. It would be, as Rodney stated earlier, it is really, really important that the applicant maintains a strict separation between the funds that are allocated for the idle and the funds that are allocated for the 3P loan. As Rodney also stated, the, the 3P loan is designated as a payroll expense loan, and that is its purpose. Therefore, it is imperative that the applicant makes certain that he or she utilizes those monies for that purpose and the idle loan not be mixed, if you'd like to use that. I, I would even go so far as to say separate bank accounts wouldn't be out of the question in order to help you maintain this separation. To answer your question specifically, you know, can I apply for the PPP and the idle funding without employees? The answer is yes, absolutely. However, there is a little bit of a caveat regarding the PPP loan process. You must make certain that you and your bank are in communication with each other and your CPA to make certain that if you do indeed file a Schedule C on your 1040, that that net earnings account amount rather is a positive number that will be used for your payroll amount. However, there are some other caveats involved with that that, that go rather deep into the weeds of, of financial taxation and accounting taxation. However, basically stated, if you're a sole proprietor, zero employees, you do file a net earnings positive number on your 1040 Schedule C, then yes, that is considered payroll and you are applicable in that regard. At the same, on the other end of the spectrum, other side, if you will, the idle also allows for this sole proprietorship to apply for idle loans and the grant that is subsequently also awarded. So you are indeed uh, able to apply. The answer to the question is yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, that is pretty comprehensive. And since I have you there, I'm going to ask you the next question, which has two pieces to it. I let my staff go at the beginning of the crisis. Can I hire them back when my PPP funding comes in? And will I qualify for forgiveness of the loan in this circumstance? In, in, indeed, Kelly, you, you, you are, that is the purpose behind the 3P loan is to indeed um, rehire them so that they are um, off of unemployment benefits and have returned to your payroll so that you are able to return them to the workforce and the, the, the banking system at that point following the guidelines will forgive that loan, if you will. So most definitely uh, you can indeed hire them and you, you must rehire them to be eligible for the forgiveness portion of, of that loan. Um, and then of course, if you, if you do rehire them, follow those 75, 25% guideline rules that the bank will help you walk through then most definitely you you will be uh, forgiven that amount of money. Okay, super. And so I'm going to turn it, the questions now over to Elsa Ramos and thank you, Elsa, for joining us again. I know how busy you are. We're very lucky to have um, a senior legal representative from the TWC here to answer these questions. So I have two straightforward questions for you, Elsa, and then there will obviously be hopefully more in our live Q&A. The first question I'm going to ask you today is, is there any way an employer can avoid the cost of unemployment benefits? Yes, thank you, Kelly. Again, Elsa Ramos here, counsel for Commissioner Aaron Demerson. He's the commissioner representing employers at the Texas Workforce Commission, and he wants to make sure that the employers out there know that the mission in our office is to assist and serve employers. So having said that, is there a way for employers to avoid chargeback? Currently, because of the natural disaster, any job separation resulting from the COVID-19 crisis is not being charged back to taxed employers. So that's already the guidance because of the natural disaster. 
if we have a job separation that resulted from the COVID-19 natural disaster, then taxed employers will not be charged back for those benefits. So that's already in place, which is great news. Excellent, thank you. My next question and final frequently asked question has two pieces to it as well. I am self-employed and can no longer work during this crisis. Can I apply for unemployment assistance? And actually who qualifies for the pandemic unemployment assistance? Right, so the people that were not able to qualify for regular unemployment, which were not regular employees whose employers were reporting wages for them, what we have now is the second wave of cases under our pandemic unemployment assistance that came about through the CARES Act. So sole proprietors, independent contractors, those of you who didn't have wages, looking back because you're your own boss, if you will, you did not qualify for regular unemployment, but now you too can qualify for unemployment assistance through the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance through the CARES Act. So that means that if you'd already filed for an unemployment claim and you were denied, and I'm gonna get this out here now because I think we have a lot of questions about that. If you were denied because you had zero wages, that was the reason you showed zero wages reported by an employer for you. Your claim, you don't have to refile, is being reviewed because you didn't qualify then. You should qualify now under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance of PUA, and you should be then eligible for $207 of weekly benefits under PUA without having submitted any other documentation about your previous earnings or income or tax filings. $207 per week. Plus on top of that, the extra $600 from the CARES Act that is being added on to anyone receiving weekly unemployment benefits. So I'm gonna say that one more time. If you're independent contractor, sole proprietor and had filed already and were denied unemployment benefits, you don't have to refile. Those claims are being looked at again independently and you would be entitled then to $207 for your weekly benefit plus the 600 uh, on top of that, that also came through the CARES Act. However, one point here, you even though you already filed and were denied, in order to get benefits, you still have to make payment requests. You still have to request those benefits every two weeks as uh, you were instructed in your filing instructions. So some people are complaining out saying, I filed, I'm not getting anything. And what I'm understanding from our UI division is that a lot of these claimants, sole proprietors, independent contractors, are not making those payment requests. So it's really important to do that. Thank you, Kelly. OK, well, thank you, Elsa. Uh, so we've reached the end of our frequently asked questions. And before I hand over to my colleague Jarvis Brewer to handle some of the live questions that have come in, I'm just going to mention that we are getting a lot of questions. Before you type in your question, if you still have a question, have a look at the published questions and see if a question like yours has already been asked and published and like it. Um, we will be trying to tackle those published questions right now. We will not get to everybody's question. There are many questions in the feed. And so just so you know, we, we won't be answering them all today, but we will be providing our contact information at the end on the final slide. So please do reach out directly to us and we will help you get answers. Um, and that's the main way we're going to be able to deal with the amount of questions. We will be also organizing future webinars so you can keep in touch with us about that. And so I am going to now hand over to my colleague Jarvis Brewer, and he is going to take care of some of the live questions that have come in and have been published. Over to you, Jarvis. Yes, thank you, Kelly. So the first question um, was submitted by Dr. James Miller, and it seems to be very popular. The question is, is there a place online to check on the status of the PPP in IDLE? I actually want to start off with Bridget, if she could again provide that customer service number for everyone. <laughs> Yes, uh, that number for it's going to be for the idol uh, because that's administered through the SBA. It's 1 800 659 2955. If it's questions and concerning the PPP, they will have to contact their lender that they applied with for status. Um, one of the questions kind of goes hand in hand with this. Someone asked, what if my lender or I don't have a, a bank that does uh, the PPP loans? Uh, the answer to that is to contact their local SBA district office. And if that's us, we do have a list that we'll be glad to email you of those lenders that are taking on 
uh, new customers. Because what is some people are finding out that if they don't have a certain kind of financing or they're not a current customer, uh, they're not able to get the PPP uh, process started with that lender. We do have a separate list and we encourage uh, people to give us a call or email us. Thank you so much for that. And we're going to move forward with this next question for Rodney, again relating to the PPP. My PPP was not funded in the first round. Do I need to refile a new request? Rodney, you're muted. My apologies. If you have been working with a lender to process your application, and that lender has continued to uh, push and promote your application through their process and move you on through uh, underwriting and hopefully up to a point where you can be um, uploaded into the SBA system, then you really there really is no need for you to reapply. All you need to do is to keep in contact with that with that approved lender. Now, what is critical here uh, is that you stay in contact with that approved lender. And in fact, the way that I've been phrasing it is the thing you don't want to do is get out of line. So when the funding that is just is recently coming through that we're hearing about here here in the last couple of days, the last 24 hours, to be honest, when that funding actually becomes available, you want your application to already be in the pipeline, already uh, already ready to be uh, acted upon. So you do not need to reapply if you've completed the process, if you've answered all the questions from your lender, and if your lender is in fact ready to upload your application. So stay in line, make sure if your lender has any additional questions that you get them answered sooner than later so that there are no delays re relative to the submittal of your application. Thank you so much for that. And this next question that was submitted, it again, goes along the lines of uh, statuses. So I'm going to refer back to you, Bridget. Uh, the question is, I applied for the IDLE almost four weeks ago and haven't heard anything at all about my process. I do have an application number as well. Are you seeing this as a common issue for the long, uh, for this long of a delay? There is uh, a situation where uh, if they applied at the very beginning in March, uh, they should have gotten an email uh, for a possibility to reapply. So they need to call that 800 number and or if they know the uh, actual date, they can give it to that representative and they can let them know if they were part of that group to reapply. Uh, they should have gotten a question or an email and the reason is, is the uh, the 10,000 advance was not uh, available on the application originally, so they revised it and simplified that process. So we encourage for those to check their emails uh, to contact that 800 number with that application number, and they can let you know what that next process is. Now, it could be the fact of the delay uh, and with this uh, additional funding that we're expecting this week, uh, that could get processed. It was just a matter of uh, the order those files came in and processed accordingly. Thank you so much for that. And this next question is more about classification of charges. So I'm gonna go to Mr. Bill Leverton. So Bill, the question is, are both business telephone line charges and cell phone charges considered utilities? Uh, yes, they are. All utility expenses, uh, as Rodney stated earlier, uh, gas, water, electric, telephone, internet, those things that are utility charges that provide services to you so that you may operate your business are definitely eligible um, under those guidelines. Thank you, sir. This next question I believe was answered a little bit earlier, but I'm going to refer to you, Rodney, just to elaborate or reiterate. The question is, I am self-employed and own my own business. I do not have employee records. How do I file for the SBA loan? Okay, so hopefully you 
if you don't have employees, um, again, the, what you're depending upon is an independent contractor kind of status, and therefore there are provisions for you to make an application. If you file your 2019 taxes, the data from that, from that tax base is what you can actually use to go ahead and make your application. If you've not filed your 2019 taxes as an independent contractor, it'll be very important for you to go ahead and finish at least calculating what, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, very specifically what line 31 on your Schedule C would have calculated up to. So you can still go ahead and calculate the uh, information and calculate what, exactly what information you would be providing on your application. So the fact that you haven't filed your applications, and we know that income taxes uh, have been uh, extended until, I want to say, July the 15th. So if you've not filed your 2019 taxes, you still need to go through the due diligence of filling out the Schedule C and particularly calculating the information that will come from line number 31. And so you can still go ahead and, and process, but you got to do the work. You must do the work in order to fill out the application online. Thank you, sir. This next question is a workforce related question, so we're going to refer to Elsa. The question is, in this COVID-19 situation, having to pay a chargeback while at the same time trying to support my existing two employees adds an extra financial burden and increases the likelihood that I will have to lay off an, an existing employee. Is there any chargeback protection for a small business owner like me in this situation? Right, so yes, so uh, we do have, because of the natural disaster, taxed employers, if you're a taxed employer, you're paying your unemployment tax, then there is chargeback protection for you taxed employers for any kind of reduction in hours of your employees or uh, layoffs of your employees that results in an unemployment claim and benefits getting paid out. So if at the beginning, if someone files a claim and it's not clear that the employer is being protected, make sure that you appeal any kind of decision that says the employer is going to be charged if the separation again if you end up having to lay off or reduce hours such that your employees can have a valid unemployment claim and get benefits if there's any chargeback in any decision you receive appeal that because taxed employers are supposed to be protected from charge for separations resulting from COVID-19. Thank you so much for that Elsa. This actually this next question is somewhat of a situational question as well. The question is, if you receive a PPP loan and had six employees, so that is the number you need to have employed at the end of the eight weeks. If you hire another employee, so a total of seven employees, can those funds be used to pay the seventh employee's payroll or can the funds only pay for six employees, which is what you are being measured against for forgiveness? So I'm going to refer to Bill for this. The, the Treasury rule stipulates uh, Jarvis, that as long as you do not drop below 75% of your payroll as originated when you when you originated the loan, then strictly speaking, you are within accordance. And so if you do indeed add additional employees, as long as that loan is not, and obviously it wouldn't have been increased, but as long as you're staying in accordance with that, then that amount will be certainly forgiven. Um, I, I think that answered the question. I hope so. And now I'm back to Elsa with a workforce related question again. The stated intent of PP funds are primarily to support small business payroll. However, there seems to be discussion of pushing employees to unemployment and rehiring them either when we go back to work or on June 30 in order to have the same level of employment at the end of Q2 quarter two. The business owners could then pay themselves the proceeds of PPP. Many employees are wanting this situation since the extra $600 a week from unemployment means a raise for them. What is legal or not legal regarding employees in the PPP? Um, what's legal or not legal? Interesting question. Ultimately, unemployment benefits are there for people, even with the extra 600, are there for people who are not, who have no jobs or whose hours were reduced to such an extent because of lack of work. The unemployment system right now is not there just to, it's, it's not supposed to be like a bonus, you know, or paid vacation. If you as an employer are able to put your people back to work, 
because you have work and you have the funds to pay them through PPP, then put your people back to work. You know, if at that point they want to continue requesting benefits, they have an obligation to report any wages that you pay them. So, so two things, either you put them back to work full time and they're no longer unemployed and would not have a valid unemployment claim, regardless of how much money they're making for you. If you go back, if they go back to the same position that they had with you, full time hours, same pay, no longer unemployed. If you pay them and you say, hey, I can't put them back to work, but I got PPP loan. I'm going to pay them now to be on leave. If they're on paid leave, yet again, they're not considered unemployed. They're getting their money from their job, but they're at home. If they're not unemployed, they would not be entitled to benefits. If they continue to make payment requests, they're obligated to report the money that they're making from you. At that point, they're receiving too much money from you to actually get any benefits. So the idea is not to incentivize people to stay home and receive unemployment benefits. If you as an employer have work for your employees, put them to work. That is what we're trying to do here. Unemployment benefits are there for people who cannot work or are not able to work because of the lack of work right now. Thank you for that explanation, Elsa. This next question I'm going to relate to Bridget. The question is, can fixed debt on loans prior to February 1st be rolled into the idle loan, basically becoming a refinance of the business debt? A very good question. A lot of times with our disaster loan program, we don't refinance uh, debt. Uh, what we do, though, is we're going to look at what we call the injury period that that business is going to suffer. So if they're shut down for six months and not able to operate, we're going to look at that debt payment for that six months. We're going to say, OK, he would have had working. He would have had income coming in to pay that uh, debt and therefore that can be reviewed very rarely at a point that we're going to review for refinancing of debt. Uh, it's not out of the question, uh, but it's reviewed based on the injury time. So if we're looking for a very long longevity and it helps the business as far as cash flow, that is something that can be discussed. And that's that whole part of that conversation that that small business owner is going to have with their loan officer. It's going to be in detail what those needs are, what their cash flow looks like before the disaster, what is it looking at as they're experiencing going through the disaster, and what does that recovery look like for them? Thank you, Bridget. Again, back to Elsa, there seems to be a lot of workforce related questions. This one specifically says, are there any rules or regulations that the PPP loan requires as far as employee status to keep the loan forgivable? Are we able to fire people due to not following policy? Are we able to hire people? Do we have to maintain a minimum hours work? I'm not sure that's a workforce question. Seems related to more of the PPP requirements unless I'm hearing that wrong. But in, in basically, are you allowed to fire people PPP aside, you're your own employer. You have policies. If your employees are not following your policies or following instructions or performing the way you want them to perform, you're still entitled to fire people for those kinds of reasons. So if that's part of the question, does that does the PPP require you to keep employees that are bad employees or that are doing a poor job? I'm going to say I don't believe it does. You're absolutely right. It is a multiple of different variables included in this question. So I'm also going to refer to Rodney for the other part, portions of the forgivable, forgivable aspects. Okay, so one of the, one of the requirements in order to be uh, forgiven, you know, the, the, the clock starts ticking on the day that your loan is originated, meaning the day that the SBA approves and issue a SBA certification number for your loan, you now have a loan and the, your loan documents are drawn up. And so that becomes the origination date of your loan your eight week clock starts ticking on that day. What else happens on that day that is very critical is an evaluation of the number of employees, not necessarily the name of your employees, but the number of your employees. And so what is going to be evaluated at the end of that period, at the end of that eight weeks, is again an evaluation of how many employees do you have? It's, it's not based off of uh, a specific individual 
with a specific social security number so that they can track it to that point. The, so the point is back to, to Elsa's uh, answer, which is absolutely correct. You know, you, you have to manage your business, but you're motivated to keep your employees, keep your workforce in place, if not necessarily by name, certainly by the number of employees that you have. So that, that's the whole motivation. In order to be eligible, there are two data points, the, the date of the loan origination and then eight weeks later. And if those two match within the within the parameters of the program, then that's what that's the amount of your loan forgiveness. That's the, the, the way the loan forgiveness amount is calculated. Now, in, in addition to that, let me throw one more thing in here. Uh, going back to to uh, to what Mr. Lieberman said, you know, if you drop below that threshold of 75 percent, then your loan forgiveness is subject to drop. You know, so so that number is not guaranteed to stay there if you make adjustments either by the number of people or you adjust the amount that you're paying those people. So you can affect the amount of your forgiveness. The second point that I want to make is that you are not going to be forgiven for more than what the loan was worth. So if you have six employees and you somehow another hire another two employees, they're not going to forgive you for more than what that original loan was. Oh. So that's that's a provision that you need to be aware of as well. But you also need to manage your business. If you can justify and you need to hire more people, by all means, do so, because that's the goal that everyone has in order to maintain you know, our state of readiness for when we reignite the economy. Thank you so much for that further clarification. Uh, we're running short on time, so I'm going to pick a few more to close this out. The next one here for Bill. What if we get the money now but can't open until June or July? Well, Jonas, you have until until June 30th, uh, technically speaking. For We're speaking about the PPP loan, and, and I'm assuming we're at right. the moment. Uh, those provisions are, are allowable up till June 30th. So if you are a business uh, that is in the healthcare or uh, nail salon, barbershop that is, has been closed due to the uh, quarantine restrictions, you have until June 30th to, to uh, expend those funds. And I, I would suspect, I, I cannot speak directly to this, but I would suspect some provisions would be made in the event that you, you are legally unable to spend the money in that time frame. And if indeed you, that is not the case, then of course the, those amounts are uh, able to be prepaid back with no penalty. In other words, you just would would give that money back to the bank. Uh, Jarvis, I would like to add one thing real quickly, and that is that for, for a lot of people who are asking questions about the SBA, um, they're, they're waiting for an answer on their idle. And I, I, would, I would like to say that they should keep in mind that the SBA thus far has processed 755,000 loans at a little over $3 billion. So they are working diligently and indeed around the clock. And I know that it's painful to say this. However, people must be patient. They are getting to them as quickly as they can. Absolutely. So there's no question that um, this COVID-19 has brought a lot of challenges as far as capacity and manpower to even go through applications. Um, so with that, I'm going to go forward to our SBA representative with a further question. I have the $10,000 advance. How and where do I report the use? Will I be getting an email or a call from someone? Yes, very good question. They will be getting an email and referencing the uh, 10000 that they received. It, once they receive it, uh, there should be a follow-up email concerning uh, their disbursement. And then in addition to that, how to apply for the idle loan program. So that should also be included. So for those that say that 10,000 forgivable, the advance is not sufficient, uh, they will be able to start the loan process as well to make sure that any additional documents that might be required to process it. If they are not, or have not received that email, they need to call that customer service number to uh, either get further direction on how to go about going further beyond that 10,000 um, possible amount for advancement. Thank you for that, Bridget. And I'm going to stick with you 
for this <clears throat> next question to okay. close this out. Um, are 5016 C's included in the CARES Act supplement? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. 5016 C6. Oh my goodness, I can't speak. 501C6 is included in the CARES Act. You know, uh, that would be something that if there, I know nonprofits are, I'm not too sure, um, and those are 5013s. I'm not too sure what a six would be. Maybe my my SBDC uh, resource partner there might be able to elaborate on that. Yes, Bill. At this point, uh, I, I, we, we believe it is uh, true that 5016Cs can apply. Um, however, I think we should check with uh, your CPA and make sure that your exact charter matches the requirements. I believe that is the case, though. Maybe Rodney has a, a further detail on that as well. I, I don't have an answer on the 5016C, but I can tell you this. And that is, is that every day it appears as if there's new updates and, and modifications and adjustments that are being made, new exemptions and exceptions that are being made. Because this is a zero cost uh, program, it costs you zero to apply. There's, there's no fees to apply. If you believe your organization is eligible or even if you have a question, our encouragement is that you apply. Work with your CPA, work with your finance agents or work with your bank and make the application and 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 because there's absolutely nothing to lose it's a no lose no fail kind of scenario I would agree. Well, we have run short on time so at this point we'll go ahead and close it out um, again if you weren't able to get your questions answered we'll have contact information in just a couple of slides that will be put up available so that you can contact either our office at the office of the governor or any of the respective SBDCs. So at this point, I'll go ahead and hand over to Kelly to close this out. Great, thank you, Jarvis. So I think I said earlier, um, there is no way that we'll be able to answer all, the, answer all the questions, but thank you for putting them in the feed. If anybody has a question they really need an answer to, they can reach out to us. There's an email here on this slide. Uh, our names are here also. We, we know that we're not that hard to find, so we would welcome you reaching out directly to either the small business team at the Office of the Governor or any of the partners and speakers that were involved in this webinar. The recording of the webinar will be made available to you, as will the slides. And I want to thank you very much. And now we are going to close out. Uh, I see our executive director, Adriana, is there. I just want to give her an opportunity to say a few final words if she wants to. And our colleague, our North Texas Community Relations Specialist, Janie Havel, will close things out. So Adriana, do you want to say a final word? Adriana might be muted. Actually, Adriana is muted, no? Yes, we can't hear you, Adriana. She's not muted through the application. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I, okay, so I'm going to... Oh. Oh, can you hear she, me now? Yes, we can. Hi there. Okay. I don't know what happened with these things, but anyway, um, I just want to say thank you to uh, our community partners. Uh, thank you to the presenters, our panel of experts for, for joining us on this. Uh, and of course, thank the attendees for, for joining us. Uh, we plan to hold more of these webinars um, across the state. Uh, one of the, the questions asked that is this was specific with our North Texas partners, but we've had uh, people join from across the state and we'll be doing more of these in the coming weeks. Uh, do follow us on our on our web page and on our social media channels. Uh, this is a very fluid situation, as we've heard, and new programs are added, new uh, uh, guidelines are, are uh, developed. So as that becomes available, we want to keep you all informed um, as quickly as possible. So thank you all. OK, great. Well, thank you, Adriana. I'm going to hand over to Janie Havel now, who's going to 
close things out and like Adriana said, I would like to echo her thanks to all of our participants, our regional partners and our panelists. Thank you so much and over to you, Janie. This is Janie Havel. I'm the North Texas Regional Representative in Governor Abbott's office, and I just want to thank all of our chambers for participating from Fort Worth, Stephenville, and Texarkana, as well as the City of Texarkana. If you should need to reach out to me for anything, I am readily available and will share my contact information through this webinar. Thanks so much. Great. So I will just say that concludes the webinar. Thank you all so much for joining and we will look forward to holding more webinars and perhaps some of you will join us again. Thank you all so much for making time for this and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.